to do that. Okay, so we're recording. And um, so the lesson here is that um, Mathematica is for, at least for integration, it's a lot easier to use. And um, uh, whereas with Matt and MATLAB is, um, uh, sometimes someone, well, it's always picky. It requires everything to be stated in the exact form of, um, of Mathematica and of MATLAB, but the, the, the MATLAB form is, well, it's typically more, a little stranger. Um, so let's see, we were, uh, the topic that we left off with um, on Tuesday was linear first order ordinary differential equations. And um, here, let me make this a little bit bigger. And um, I'll just go through this, uh, this happy subject, I call it a happy subject because we can always solve it. So uh, the general form of a linear first order ordinary differential equation is this. We can always find an integrated factor that makes this exact. And uh, what we do is we set P equal to this, Q equal to alpha. And then the conditions are that the y derivative of p be the x derivative of q. And that gives us an equation for the integrating factor, which um, is simply uh, that log alpha is an integral of r, or alpha is uh, an exponential of that integral of r. And, um, Uh, we can go further. Um, we can say since alpha r is alpha is the x derivative of alpha, we have alpha y sub x plus alpha r y. That's the differential equation. That's equal to uh, alpha y sub x plus alpha x y. But that's the x derivative of alpha y, and that's supposed to be equal to alpha s. And so the x derivative. So the equation here is uh, d dx of, um, this is, I do not understand that. One of you must know what is the, actually, let me just grab this because I was a little bit sloppy there. So d dx of alpha y um, is equal to, alpha s, so um, alpha y is equal to an integral up to x of alpha of, um, let us say, x prime s of x prime dx prime. And um, so that tells us then that y is one over alpha times this integral up to x of alpha s dx prime, and that's uh, this equation. If you now put in um, uh, the initial conditions and so forth, in other words, you integrate this thing from x zero to x, and you're dividing here by alpha of x, and you decide uh, that this alpha x is, uh, of x is also an integral from x zero and there's a boundary condition here, alpha of x zero. Well, if you put all that in, you get this expression here. Um, the, the prefactor uh, multiplied by the first term is the solution of the homogeneous equation, the uh, dy dx plus ry equals zero. Um, the second term multiplied by the first term is a particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation. So what this does then is it says that the general solution of the, of the inhomogeneous equation 
is a particular solution to the inhomogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous equation. So the general solution is fairly, fairly simple. Of course, it's general solution satisfying the boundary condition y of x zero and so forth. Um, now, we were able to find the integrating factor because the equation was linear. Um, and uh, um, so we could set P equal to this, Q equal to that. And uh, in that case, P over Q is not, uh, is, is, is even linear. But um, when P over Q is nonlinear in Y, then uh, integrating factors are much harder to find when non-existent. Um, here are a couple of examples. Um, the first one is a little bit interesting, so maybe I'll just mention it. This is just ordinary basic freshman physics. The downward speed of a mass M in a gravitational field of constant acceleration G is described by an inhomogeneous ODE M dV dt, that's MA equals MG, G being the acceleration. But um, there's another force here minus uh, the air resistance. And the, and the air resistance is proportional to the speed. So um, one then finds the exact solution, which looks like this. And what you see here is that as time goes on, there's a terminal velocity, which is mg over v. And that terminal speed is about 200 kilometers per hour for a man jumping off a building. Um, on the other hand, a diving peregrine falcon can exceed 320 kilometers per hour, as can a falling bullet. Of course, in the bullet, you've got a very dense, a very heavy um, metal lead and uh, very so you have very little air resistance because the bullet is small compared to its weight. Um, but B over M scales like the linear size um, as M goes as um, basically the, well, how shall I say M over B. So B is not so quite so obvious. Yeah, all right. So B goes as the area, M goes as the volume. So B o M over B goes as the linear sale. That's why mice can fall down mine shafts and run off and hurt, unhurt and uh, insects and birds can fly. Um, if the falling bodies are microscopic, then uh, what you have is a, uh, a Boltzmann distribution. Um, things that are in between microscopic and macroscopic, but very small, like uh, virus particles, the coronavirus particle, for example, can be as small as a tenth of a micron or 10 to the minus seven meters. And um, that's why they can hang in the air for hours. Um, and uh, that's why uh, ventilation is uh, the best way to protect people from, uh, from um, coronavirus. By the way, remember, uh, if you were here yesterday, you saw that when I showed how to use MATLAB to solve differential equations, one, and I picked a fairly simple differential equation, well, simple for MATLAB, not so simple for me, um, the solution was an exponential of a polylog plus a log. And um, so since uh, I hadn't discussed polylogs, I'll just mention something about polylogs uh, to you. Um, I think if I go here, I can get to the polylog pretty quickly, yeah. So this is, uh, polylogs are um, uh, particular Dirichlet series. Um, the the, the uh, notation is L I sub S of Z, and it's this Dirichlet series, Z to the K over K raised to the power S. 
Um, it can, that can also be written as polylog of S and Z. And um, it, it can, the series converges for absolute value of Z less than one and any complex S, but uh, you can analytically continue it uh, basically everywhere. And what's one of the remarkable things about the polylogarithm or the polylog is that it has this weird gamma function like uh, property. So the trilogarithm is an integral of the dilogarithm, and the dilogarithm is an integral of the logarithm. And uh, the first polylog is, is the ordinary log minus the ordinary log of one minus z. Okay, so much for polylogs. Um, uh, back uh, where we were, um, I think we had basically finished this uh, topic here. There's some more examples. If you're interested in biophysics, you should read that example. Now, um, the, 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 well, just let us say macroscopic systems involve huge numbers of particles and um, uh, they would be absolutely hopeless um, uh, from the point of view of solving them, if it weren't the fact that um, at low temperatures, they um, basically execute small oscillations about their minima. And so, for example, if the Lagrangian for a, a system of 3n coordinates, um, so we have, oh, here I gave the masses. This is kind of stupid. Uh, I have the masses, m sub i, obviously the, ma the mass in almost every case um, is the same for each particle. So the mass would be a fun, uh, would be n masses with three n coordinates and then u as a potential. Uh, but uh, then you, if you rescale things, you let Q equal to this square root times Xi, you wind up with an expression like this. Also, if you said V of Q equal to U of X. So you get it down to a very nice form where this is a, this Q is a three N vector now. And um, the, the equivalent Hamiltonian looks like this. And, um, it has a minimum energy at Q zero, the first derivatives there vanish. And um, consequently, the, uh, the particles vibrate around uh, Q zero. The Lagrangian there looks like this. Again, if we expand V and um, uh, ignore the first term, which is just a constant. Uh, the, the terms linear in R are zero, R being the distance from the minimum. And um, what you then uh, have is uh, you have this matrix here, but you can diagonalize it by an orthogonal transformation because it's a symmetric matrix. Remember, we covered such things in chapter one. Um, and so then you, when it's diagonalized, it looks like this. Um, this is the diagonal form of the second derivatives. And um, S are the new coordinates, the, the 3n by 3n orthogonal matrix operating on the 3n vector R, R being qi minus qi zero, um, you then get this expression, Lagrange's equations then are m si double dot is minus this number times si. These then are normal modes that oscillate according to cosines and sines. The frequencies are real because uh, at a minimum, these derivatives are um, positive or zero perhaps, but positive. Um, I see I screwed up a space there. Um, that's strange. Um, all right, let me just 
move that over and this over and then try it again. Anyway, um, the next the next topic is um, uh, systems of ordinary differential equations. And now this is something that MATLAB does very well because um, MATLAB um, is basically a matrix. Uh, matrices and vectors are at, uh, the fundamental, uh, among the fundamental building blocks of MATLAB. And um, so the idea here is if you have n first order ordinary differential equations like this, x one dot is f of all the n x's dot 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 x n dot is uh, is an, a different function of all the uh, x's. We say it's autonomous if the f's don't uh, don't involve time and. Um, and uh, it turns out, however, that first order autonomous systems are extremely general. They can represent systems that do depend upon time as well as systems of higher order differential equations. And um, as I said, MATLAB does a very nice job integrating these things. And in fact, I'd, I'd uh, encourage you if you have some spare time, I guess, Graduate students tend not to have spare time, <laughs> but if you do, you can play with um, messy. You can play with um, with uh, MATLAB and uh, solve systems of um, differential equations, and uh, you and um, you can make. You can have them make graphs, and it's it's rather amusing, actually. Anyway, uh, if you have a, if you want to make a time-dependent system, autonomous, what you do is you set t equal to x n plus one, and then so the f i's of t just become f i's of an extra variable, and then you add an extra equation. The extra equation is x n plus one dot which is t dot, well, it's equal to one. And um, so in that way, you can turn uh, this particular differential equation into this autonomous system by setting just x equal x1, t equal to x2. And you can do the same thing turn, to turn a higher order differential equation into a system of first order differential equations. So in other words, first order differential equations are not necessarily trivial because they can be hiding. In fact, first order autonomous differential equations can be hiding time dependence and they can be hiding uh, higher order uh, equations. So for example, if you have a, uh, the third time derivative of x is equal to x cubed plus the square of the first time derivative of x, you can um, write that as an autonomous system of, of, uh, of um, three equations, a system of three uh, equations. And the way you do that is you set x3 equal to x, x2 uh, equal to x3 dot, and x1 equal to x2 dot. And um, I was playing with this and I took, um, I just basically pulled this out of my nose and um, wrote the equations this way. This is, these are sort of harmonic equations. X double dot is something, but it's not just X, it's also Y. Y double dot is something. And um, uh, so I wrote this then as a, it's a, there are two second order differential equations. I wrote it as four first order autonomous uh, equations. And, um, and then I plotted uh, a representative trajectory and it's, 
I've got to admit, it's quite amusing. Um, the MATLAB scripts are in the differential equations folder or directory, and you just go to github or github dot com slash my name, middle initial E for Eric. Anyway, so um, moving on to the other sections, um, an nth order ordinary differential equation that looks like this with a d by dx here, this is exact uh, because it's um, the differential of something, this being the something. And um, an example is if we have y prime plus x squared y, d by dx of it is this, and um, you can, um, we can, we can solve that uh, because it's d by dx of something, we then set the something equal to a constant. And now we're back with the trusty first order ordinary differential equation. And we solve that using the method of section 716 and we get this. Um, and then one can find sometimes integrating factors. And so I'm gonna basically just skip the rest of that. Uh, constant coefficient differential equations. Well, when the, uh, when the coefficients are constant, you can do cool things like um, uh, write the function as uh, an exponential um, where z is complex. So that's like a, a Fourier transform or a Laplace transform. And um, you can then find the number z by substituting into this expression. And what you get after you factor out e to the zt is you get a polynomial equation. And by the fundamental theorem of algebra, uh, we know that we have n solutions. I'm gonna skip the rest of that. Um, let's let's, let's go, uh, stop now at singular points of second order ordinary differential equations. Um, So we start here with a couple of definitions. So if the equation in the form y double prime equals f of that, if the acceleration is finite at x zero for all finite y and y and first derivatives, velocity then if that's the acceleration, then x zero is said to be a regular point of the ODE. On the other hand, if y double prime is infinite at x zero for finite y and y prime, then x zero is said to be a singular point of the ODE. So um, the question is, what is uh, y double prime? Is it gonna be finite or not? And we'll see that when it's not finite, when it's infinite and the point is singular, there are then two kinds of singular points. There are the okay points and the seriously, the, the essential singularities. Um, so in particular, if, if, the, if the equation is linear and homogeneous and both P and Q are finite, then X zero is a regular point. But if p and x of x zero and q or q or both are infinite, then x zero is singular, because y double prime will be um, uh, infinite at least for some y prime and y. But now there are two kinds of essential, uh, two kinds of singular points. If P and Q diverge as X goes to X zero, but X minus X zero times P and X minus X zero squared times Q remain finite as X goes to X zero, then X zero is said to be a regular singular point or a non-essential singular point. But if either one of these diverges as X goes to X zero, then X zero 
is an irregular singular point or a, an essential singularity. Um, so these are, these are just definitions that um, you want to read over a couple of times to make sure you understand exactly what, um, what they uh, mean. Um, point at infinity, I, I think this is not all that important. I mean, it's, I don't know, I don't, I'm not fond of this point of infinity business. What, what one does is one sets z equal to one over x, and then if these quantities, this one, that, and that remain finite as z goes to zero, then infinity is a regular point of the ODE. If they don't remain finite, but this quantity and that one remain finite, then the point of infinity is a regular singular point. Otherwise, the point of infinity is an irregular or an essential singularity. Um, remember the, 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 the actually the, in the complex plane, infinity is, is kind of a circle of radius R, the limit of that, as you said, R going to infinity. Um, so it's hardly a point, at the very least, it's an infinite circle. Um, but anyway, people call it a point by means of this uh, sleight of hand. Um, let, let's look at Legendre's equation for a moment. Um, we'll see later that it's that there's something called self-adjoint form and that looks like that. But um, if we unpack the self-adjoint form and divide by this factor, we get this expression. And what we see is that uh, y double prime is infinite when x go at x equal to plus or minus one and infinity, but the plus or minus one is what I wanna focus on. Um, on the other hand, it has, th these points are regular because this singularity, of course, one over x squared is one over uh, x minus one, x plus one. So um, if you multiply by x minus one or x plus one, um, this is being p and that being q, they remain finite as x goes to one. Um, Okay, now, um, Frobenius um, showed how to form, how to find power series. Let me just take this thing and put it over here so it doesn't obscure things anymore. Um, Frobenius showed how to find a power series solution of a second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation. In other words, something like this at any of its regular or regular singular points. And so what he did basically was to set P, little p to be X big P and little q to be X squared big Q. And he also uh, assumed that P and Q are analytic or maybe even polynomials, which is the nicest case. And um, that X zero, um, is a regular or a regular singular point of the ODE. Now, of course, his method also works for any value of x zero, but it would be simpler to it's simpler to explain for x um, zero equal to zero. Um, let me just write a note to myself. Okay. Um, so we can rewrite, we can multiply this differential equation by x squared and what we get is x squared y double prime plus xp plus q, xp y prime plus qy equals zero. And then um, following Frobenius, we um, expand y as a power series about x in x about the point x zero equal to zero. And um, I'm sorry about this screen constantly shaking. Uh, I, 
I don't know what to do about it. Um, anyway, any of you guys have advice for how to avoid the um, exquisite sensitivity of to touch of some Apple devices? I'd be really grateful to hear about it. Um, anyway, we expand Y as a power series about X zero. And I'm gonna write it this way because the lowest term needn't be a constant. It could be X to the R. And, and, and here A zero is the coefficient of the lowest power of X in, in, in the series solution for Y of X. And so what we do is we, 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 of course, we want to solve this equation. So we write Y like this, and then we form the first and second derivatives and we substitute them back into the original equation. So the first derivative looks like this. The second derivative looks like that. It's just differentiating polynomials. Now we substitute them all into the original differential equation and we get something that is um, complicated. Uh, well, I mean, it's not depends on, it's somewhat complicated, certainly a mess to look at. Um, however, if this is to be satisfied, if this is really a solution, then it has to be true for all values of X. And well, that means then that the coefficient of every power of X must vanish. The lowest power of X is X to the R, because we said that a zero was not zero. That's how R is defined. The, um, the coefficient of the lowest power X to the R is a zero times this thing here with N equal to zero. And that's this thing. A zero we said was non-zero. So the factor in the inside the brackets must vanish. And so that's R times r plus one plus p of zero plus q of zero equals zero. This is called the initial equation. And it has two roots, r1 and r2, obviously this is a quadratic equation. And um, so we, we then basically uh, are starting out here with basically two solutions, one for r1 and one for r2. At least in principle, looks like that at least. So then to analyze the rest of this, what we do is we set P equal to a power series, Q equal to a power series. Remember P and Q were um, little p is X big P and little Q is X squared big Q. And um, in general, little p and little Q are simple polynomials, they might even be constants, um, but, in, but in general, uh, they're infinite series. And P zero is P of zero, Q zero is Q of zero. And then of course, we're gonna say that the coefficient not only of X to the R must vanish, but the coefficient of X to the R plus K must vanish. And then if we look at, this equation um, for um, n equals k, uh, what we find is that um, the coefficient a k, we can re-express the coefficient a k in terms of the coefficients, the lesser coefficients, the coefficients a j from zero to k minus one and so we, this is called a recurrence relation. I, I think it's also called a recursion relation, which seems to me to be an easier word to say. Um, anyhow, what you can see uh, in exercise 16 is that this, this is the value of AK. And when the P's and Q's are polynomials of low degree, these equations are fairly simple. And um, 
when the roots R1 and R2 are complex, then the coefficients An are complex, and the real and imaginary parts of the of the complex solution then are two real solutions of the differential equation. And um, one example of that is uh, probably this. One of the simplest examples of that is the uh, harmonic equation, y double prime plus omega squared y equals zero. So this is a simple harmonic oscillator that we, we people in physics departments drag out. Every time there's something new to tell the students about, we drag out the harmonic oscillator and um, blow it up and um, discuss it. Anyway, the if we uh, do it, uh, well, if we follow Frobenius, we first write it in this form. P is zero, Q is omega squared, X squared. So the P terms are all zero. The Q terms are just constants. The initial, initial equation, not initial, but the initial equation is R, R, plus, R minus one equals zero. There are two roots, R one equals zero, R two equals one. For R1 equal to zero, the P's and Q's vanish except for Q2 equal to omega squared. So the recurrence relation looks like this and it turns out to be something very simple. So in particular, A2 is this, A2N is related to A0. They're all related to A0. And um, you get no information about A1. That means we can just set A1 equal to zero. To, for simplicity. And so then we get this expression, AK is minus omega squared, AK minus two over K, K minus one. All the odd terms vanish. The solution is then uh, A sub N X to the N, A sub two uh, N is given by this, substituting in that we see it's a cosine. If you then take the second root, you find AK is AK minus two, uh, like this, and, and A2N is then this with 2N minus one factorial. We set the terms of odd index equal to zero and substitute, we get a sign term. Now, one of the really interesting things from the point of view of physics is that if you apply Frobenius's method, you sometimes get sensible solutions only when a parameter in the ordinary differential equation assumes a special value called an eigenvalue. And in particular, if we go back to Legendre's equation um, and we write it this way, well, it is this, that's one, the form we already saw. If we rewrite it in this form, we find P is this and Q is that. They're analytic, but not polynomials. And so what we do is we just substitute uh, our expansions for y, y prime and y double prime directly into Legendre's equation, we can get this expression here. The coefficient of the lowest power of, R, of x is r, r minus one a zero. In this case, then r is zero or r is one. I'm sorry, yeah, r is zero or one. For uh, r equals zero, we shift the index n. Uh, to j plus two and replace n by j in the other terms. And this expression becomes that. Uh, since the coefficient of xj vanishes, we get a recursion relation that looks like this. Now, if we look at this recursion relation, we've got essentially for big j, we've got j squared in the numerator and j squared in the denominator. So these coefficients are not going to zero as uh, j goes to infinity. Instead, they're basically uh, plateauing somewhere. And so what um, is the solution? The solution is 
that only if lambda takes a value such that this series terminates, but then the series will terminate a course. Let me, let me change colors here. What am I doing? Oh God, here we go. All right, I'm switching to red. So in other words, this thing, a j plus two is equal to zero if lambda is equal to j j plus one. And um, so it uh, so the series terminates, and uh, the solution, instead of being an infinite series, is a polynomial, and it's called a Legendre polynomial. And we'll discuss them back in chapter nine. Um, let me see how far we're, I wanted to go in this class uh, today. Um, so we are at Frobenius. Yeah, we can probably do this. Another example is uh, Hermit's equation. Um, so first you determine how Y behaves as X goes to infinity. And uh, looking at this point of infinity, we see we've got an essential singularity at infinity. And uh, in particular, when X is big, this equation is X double prime is X squared Y. And so we can satisfy that approximately by Y is E to the minus X squared over two. So what we do is we set y, the, y equal to e to the minus x squared over two, which is kind of the way it is at infinity, times h of x, hoping that h of x is nice and simple. And it turns out it's a polynomial. So the equation for little h then is this. It's regular for all x. P is this, Q is that. And what one finds, well, I, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but you find that you've got a recursion relation that looks like this. Um, now, this one, again, it, 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 uh, the coefficients don't go to zero as n goes to infinity, but they, they decrease slowly as one over n, and that's too slow for convergence. And so what must be true is that lambda must equal um, 2n plus uh, one. And um, these are the even polynomials. The odd polynomials just said R equal to one, and then you find two N plus three minus lambda has to vanish, and you get lambda three, five, and so forth. Or anyway, you get that the, the uh, lambda is uh, even zero, two, and so forth. With the hydrogen atom, something similar happens. Uh, the non-relativistic equation looks like this. It's a regular singular point at zero, an essential singularity at infinity. So we said R equal to R to the L times S. And um, so then in order to make this, uh, to solve this equation, near r equal to zero, we set gamma equal to minus L, L plus one. And then to fix the essential singularity infinity, we set S equal to E minus delta R times little s. And then for huge R, what we see is that delta should be square root of alpha. It's not obvious, but if you play with this, you can see that's true. Um, so then what we do is we set R the solution equal to R to the L E to the minus square root of minus alpha R S. And then we find S and um, when one finds uh, S, uh, you actually then find the eigenvalues of the um, hydrogen atom, at least if you, of course, substitute for alpha, beta and gamma, the correct uh, values uh, that occur um, in Schrodinger's equation, the radial Schrodinger equation. Um, 
And then, as I said earlier, Frobenius's method, of course, works for arbitrary points x zero. I just use, I said x zero equal to zero, just so we don't have, so we didn't have, so I didn't have x zero all over the place, uh, which just makes the equations harder to read. Now, um, uh, there's a mathematician um, named Fuchs. Um, I, in fact, know a physicist named Fuchs. Um, anyway, uh, he um, showed that if you apply Frobenius's method to a linear homogeneous second order ordinary differential equation, you expand about a regular point or a regular singular point, then you always get at least one power series solutions. And here are the details. If the roots, remember the initial equation, if you, the roots of the initial equation are um, equal, you only get one solution. If the two roots differ by a non-integer, you get two solutions. And if the two solutions differ by, the two roots differ by an integer, then the bigger root gives you a solution. And um, so um, I think I'm going to skip that example. Um, so we have here even and odd differential operators. And let's consider this parity transformation x goes to minus x. And let's consider what that does to something x to the n, the p derivative of x to the k. Well, if you carry out the differentiation, what you get is uh, k factorial of k minus p factorial uh, x to the n plus k minus p. And so letting x going to minus, uh, to minus x, that gives you minus one to the n plus k minus p. Um, what did I do here? Right, minus one to the n plus k minus p. And um, so the corresponding differential operator, x to the n and then p derivatives goes as minus one to the n minus p or equivalently minus one to the n plus p because um, the in either case, you have p factors of minus one as well as n factors of minus one. So that tells you the derivatives and powers acquire similar minus signs. Now, the reflected form of the second order linear differential operator therefore is, and what happens? You get h zero of minus x minus h one of minus x because of the derivative and then h2 of minus x, second derivative. Uh, we say an operator is even if it's unchanged by reflection. And in that case, L of minus x is L of x. Odd, if, it's, if it changes sign under reflection, L of minus x is minus L of x. And What's, um, what you have to notice here is that not every differential operator is either even or odd. A, a differential operator can be neither even nor odd. But what you can do is you can write the differential operator in this form as the sum of an even differential operator plus an odd differential operator. And in, in reality, Many of the standard differential operators just have h2 equal to minus one and, um, and in fact are even. Um, so suppose y of x is a solution of the ODE, L of x, y of x equals zero, and L of minus x and y of minus x are well defined for all x, I mean. Then we have L of minus X acting on Y of minus X uh, is zero because that's zero. But if L of minus X is plus or minus 
L of X. In other words, L is even or odd. Then we have L of X, Y of minus X equals zero. So that tells us then that if a differential operator L has definite parity, uh, that is if it's either even or odd, then Y of minus X is a solution whenever Y of X is a solution. So the solutions come in pairs, one even and uh, one odd. Um, let me write a note to myself here. Uh, okay, Ronsky's determinant. So, um, Suppose we, uh, here's just a mathematical definition. Remember way back in chapter one, I emphasized linear dependence, linear independence. Um, if um, n functions are linearly dependent, then there's a set of coefficients, not all zero, such that the sum, this sum vanishes for all x. Um, and if we differentiate i times, we get uh, i more equations. We get another i equations. And um, so if the functions are linearly dependent, so are their derivatives, uh, all of the derivatives. Now, of course, if they're polynomials, then after a while, there aren't any more derivatives. They're all zero. Um, but um, if they're... You know, anyway, um, so I wanna introduce a notation here. Uh, I'm gonna use the Y's and their derivatives to define a matrix in this funny kind of way. And then the linear dependence of the functions uh, can be written as zero is K is Y on K for some non-zero vector k. And since y maps a non-zero vector to zero, its columns are linearly dependent, so its determinant must vanish and um, consequent. And this determinant then is called the Bronsky. And so this, so uh, you see, I defined this strange looking matrix its determinant is called the Ronskian. And um, the Ronskian that's used most often is um, basically a two by two matrix actually in, in most cases, um, most simple cases at least. And we see that it vanishes on an interval if and only if the functions or their derivatives are linearly dependent on the interval. And um, so what's, what, what, what runs, one of the uses of the Ronskian is finding a second solution to a differential equation if you've got one solution. And so suppose you have two linearly independent solutions of this equation, then the Ronskian doesn't vanish, except maybe at isolated points. And its derivative is given by this, but then we can substitute for the second derivatives. Namely, use the differential equation to write the second derivatives in terms of the first derivatives and y, and we get that. And now combining them, um, what we see is that there's a cancellation, the q terms cancel, and we just have the p term. So now this tells us that the first derivative of the Ronskian is equal to minus P of X times the Ronskian, where P is the function that multiplied the first derivative in the original differential equation. Well, this is one of those equations that we can actually integrate. Um, we love equations like this because, um, uh, God. I just change the color. So in other words, what we can what we can say here is that W 
Oh God, I really screwed that up. What we have is that W prime over W is equal to minus P of X and integrating we get log W is uh, minus the integral of uh, P of X prime DX prime up to X log W of X over say W of zero. There I put in all the details and um, or X zero exponentiating we get W of X equals W I'm going to change it now to X zero e to the minus integral X zero to X P of X prime DX prime. So what we get then is um, a formula, a general formula for the Vronskian. Uh, whenever you have a second order linear differential equation, uh, it's homogeneous and you have two linearly independent solutions, you can find uh, uh, a formula for the Vronskian. And this in fact is said to be Abel's formula for the Vronskian. Abel died by the way at the age of 27. Um, anyway, now that we know what the Ronskian is, we go back to the original differential equation and we rewrite our formula for the Ronskian. And we notice that we can write it in this curious way. Y1 squared d by dx of y2 over y1. And equivalently then that is dividing by y1 squared, we get the derivative of y2 over y1 is the ratio of the Ronsky into the square of y1. But then that just is telling us that this fraction is the integral of the right-hand side. And now we know what w is because it's an integral of p. And so now we have, apart from multiplicative constants, additive and multiplicative constants, we've got a formula for a second solution if we know the first solution. So this thing is a, the second solution is a multiple of the first solution. Um, and one important case is when P vanishes, then uh, the Ronskian is a constant and the second solution is just uh, just looks like that. And um, if we go back to Fuchs's theorem, then we have that uh, Frobenius's expansion about a regular point or a regular singular point, we know we get at least one solution. From this solution in general, we can use Ronsky's trick to find a linearly independent second solution. So we basically always get two linearly independent solutions if we expand a second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation about a regular point or about a regular singular point. Now you might say, well, why don't we get three solutions? And uh, the reason is that if Y1, Y2, and Y3 were three linearly independent solutions of this uh, second order ODE, then the third order Ronskian would not vanish except at isolated points because these are three linearly independent solutions. But the ODE itself relates the second derivatives to the first derivatives. So these, so this third line is a multiple of the top two. In other words, the Ronskian looks like this. And consequently, the determinant vanishes because the bottom row is a, um, is a linear combination of the first two rows. And we can extend this argument to show that if you have an nth order linear homogeneous ODE, you have at most n linearly independent solutions. So I, I think that's all we need to say about that. Um, Boundary conditions, well, what you know instinctively is that um, you basically need two boundary conditions for a second order linear uh, ODE. Um, for example, um, if you wanna know when a ball that you're gonna drop hits the ground, you need to know at what height do you release it. 
and that it and at what speed you release it do you just release it or do you throw it and um that's uh, just an example um so uh in general boundary conditions um uh or one way of thinking about boundary conditions are that we say y of x is um a linear combination of n linearly independent um, solutions. This is an nth order uh, case. And um, we're going to impose n boundary conditions that y of x1 is b1, y of x2 is b2, y of xn is bn, and so forth. Um, so what does this tell us? This tells us that, um, and here we're assuming the yk is a linearly independent um, and that this matrix y is, um, this, this is a different matrix y, this is yk of xj is yjk. We're saying it's non-singular, the determinant y is not zero, then, um, Suppose B is a vector with components B, J, and C is a vector with components C, K. Then those boundary conditions that I wrote down, these boundary conditions um, can be written Y of X, J is a sum C, K, Y, K of uh, X, J equals B, J. Um, or equivalently, y times c is b. The determinant of y is non-zero, so these coefficients c are uniquely given by y inverse b. So, um, in other words, if if we express y as a linear combination of the n linearly independent solutions and require that at each of the n xj's y equal bj, then this in matrix form is the equation y c equals b. Since the determinant of y is non-zero, c is y inverse b and the solution is unique. So this is a unique solution that satisfies the boundary conditions. And um, so though that's uh, boundary conditions that just involve um, the function as opposed to its derivative, but of course boundary conditions can involve the derivatives. Um, and um, in fact, the original example, the example I just gave you of dropping something, and I said, well, you can uh, you, know, you specify the y of zero and y prime of zero, how, how fast it's moving at time zero. Um, uh, that would be uh, uh, boundary conditions with derivatives. Whereas the, the case that I just discussed would be to say, we're going to determine the trajectory if we say that y at one time is uh, at this height, and then at another time it's at uh, a different height, uh, what's the trajectory? And um, uh, is then a unique solution? And uh, if the times are very close together, then that means it had to be moving pretty fast uh, initially. If on the other hand, um, the times are um, quite far apart, then um, uh, then it could have been moving very slowly. And of course, there are cases where you just can't satisfy those boundary conditions, I would think. Anyway, so if you have derivatives, then we define a matrix that looks like this. The boundary conditions look like that. As long as y is non-singular, you get unique boundary conditions like this. Um, I'm going to skip the, B, excuse me, the bj equal to zero conditions. So, uh, um, but you can read that. And I'm going to skip this also. Um, let's begin by discussing this variational problem. Um, 
this is uh, something that we've talked about, something we've talked about things like this before when we talk about the principle of least action. Um, here, I'm thinking of E as an energy function. So P is a one function, Q is another function, and I've got the first derivative squared and the function squared. And so for what functions U is E of U plus delta U uh, unchanged to first order when U of X is changed very slightly. And um, so I'm gonna suppress the X dependence I mean, the x-dependence is going to be there. It's just that I'm, I'm going to suppress explicit mention of the x-dependence. So the first order change in E is then um, two u prime, change of u prime, two q, well, q times two u, change in u, and um, delta u prime, of course, is the derivative of delta u. We set that equal to zero, and um, we then uh, integrate by parts here. We can rewrite this as the derivative of P U prime delta U minus the derivative of P U prime times delta U. And then we just, this guy just comes along here. Uh, this thing becomes a bound, becomes the, just the, just depends upon the endpoints, and this part is all proportional to delta u. So if E is to vanish to first order, then this quantity in here has to vanish to first order. And it has to satisfy then a differential equation, LU, which is this. So now we see um, things taking shape in a kind of nice way, I think, because um, if E is stationary, then U has to satisfy a differential equation. In fact, this is in self-adjoint form, actually. Um, if we say that E is to be stationary with respect to all tiny changes, including ones that occur at the endpoints, whereas here I was just saying it's uh, stationary with respect to all tiny changes that vanish at the endpoint. So these are in changes between A and B. Um, then what we get is we have to satisfy the differential equation and we also have, we also get boundary conditions, namely that these guys have to vanish. P of B, U prime of B has to vanish and P of A, U prime of A has to vanish. And these are called natural boundary conditions. And you see why they're natural, they occur if you're just saying that the energy um, is constant to first order, no matter what you do, uh, if you just do a little bit anywhere at the endpoints and or anywhere inside. Um, if, if P of A and P of B are both non-zero, then these natural boundary conditions apply, imply Neumann's boundary conditions, which are that the derivatives vanish at the endpoint. So these are called the Neumann boundary conditions. I have to call Neumann. So the next topic is self-adjoint differential operators. And here, um, this is a matter of definition, but it's a, it's a convenient definition, which is why we define it. Um, and uh, here's a, a, a differential operator that's said to be self-adjoint. This is Q of X minus D by DX of P of X D by DX. This is said to be a self-adjoint differential operator. And why is it, is it interesting? Well, if we take the inner product of L acting on one function, the inner product with another function, and here we're, we're thinking of them as being real for the moment, then it's just an integral from A to B of V L U. L U on the other hand is this. And now if we rewrite things um, and integrate by parts, uh, we have this, we're gonna integrate by parts twice actually. 
And so the first time we get this, the second term time we get this and two boundary terms. And so then we've got that V L of U is equal to L of V times U plus a bunch of boundary terms. This is called Green's formula. And uh, this, this is the Green who invented Green's functions. Um, Schwinger, by the way, was a, an admirer of Green. And um, he, in fact, once visited uh, the birthplace of George Green. Um, anyway, the difference between V L of U and U L of V is, of course, these boundary terms right here. And now, if you look at the boundary terms, what they are is they're the Ronsky and the evaluated at the endpoints. So this is quite a nice formula, namely that the that V L U minus U L V is the p function, that p function. Uh, times the Ronskian evaluated at the two boundary points, evaluated at B minus its value, uh, its value at B minus value at, at, at A. The differential form is that just the thing inside is the derivative of this. So VLU minus ULV is the, der the X derivative of PW of U and V. And that's called Lagrange's identity. Um, and so if you have a twice differentiable, if you have twice differentiable functions U and V that satisfy these boundary, satisfy boundary conditions that make the boundary term vanish. So the boundary term is no longer there. Then the real differential operator um, is uh, symmetric, at least on this space of uh, functions U and V. And uh, then we say that VLU is equal to ULV. And uh, so now you're, you're starting to see why it is we call this self-adjoint, because in this case, um, the adjoint of, uh, normally we would write VLU is, what did I do here? E L U right. Normally, we would have written this differently. I, I mean, I'm I, you could write it this way, but you can also. It's equally natural to write this as V L U is then equal to L of V U D X. God, if only I had taken penmanship as a child. So this, let me undo this. So L of V U DX, which we could say was L V U. And what, back in chapter one, when we talked about uh, such things, we would have said, that V L U is equal to L adjoint V U. And now we're saying that this is equal to L V U. That means that these two things are equal. And so the thing is self adjoint. So that's why we say that this uh, is this differential operator is formally self-adjoint. Okay. And um, well, I guess I'm just saying that here, a real operator, linear operator in a real vector space that satisfies this condition is, um, is uh, said to be symmetric and self-adjoint. In this sense, the differential operator L is self-adjoint on the space of functions that satisfy the boundary condition, uh, this boundary condition, namely that the Ronskian vanishes at the endpoints, at least when multiplied by P. Um, of course, in quantum mechanics, we're often dealing with wave functions that are complex. 
So, um, keep, by the way, we haven't had a question at all. Um, does somebody want to use uh, the chat thing to, I should have started the chat thing at the very beginning. Does somebody want to use it to write a question here? I, um, All right, well, we're basically out of time if there's no question. Um, I'll um, go over some of this uh, next Tuesday and, um, and then go on. Um, so nobody wants to write a question in the chat. Um, Box. No questions just, just yet, sir. Just digesting. I didn't quite understand. What did you say? No questions just yet over the material you're going through. I'm trying to digest the material at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's it's um well, the thing to do is, you know, you listen to me and then you can read the book on your own and or you can discuss it with a friend if you have a friend who is taking the course. Um, I, I know when I was a graduate student listening to Schwinger talk about quantum mechanics, um, uh, it was often true that uh, we um, were just furiously writing down what he was saying without really trying to understand. And he would also, by the way, he would leave. Uh, as soon as he finished the lecture, he would leave immediately. And since the students were all copying down, that was, you know, before the internet and iPads and iPhones and so forth. And, um, so the students would be furiously writing things down. So no one ever got to answer, ask a question um, because he was gone before um, the question to the kids stopped writing. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna stop this uh, now and uh, wish you all a good weekend and um, stay safe and uh, try to avoid COVID and uh, gunshots and uh, fast cars and so forth. Okay, bye-bye. I don't know what happened here. I thought I ended the meeting and yet the thing is still recording. Um, end.